Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar on how chemical defects influence charging of nanoporous carbon-based supercapacitors. My name is Jeff Kenvin, and I'm the Vice President of Science at Micromerdics Instrument Corporation. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple engagement tools you may use. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Additional materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. If you experience any problems during the session, you can find answers to some common technical issues located in the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available after today's webcast and will be emailed to you once the session has concluded. I'm pleased to do, introduce today's speaker, Professor Roland Palenque. Roland is a CNRS Director of Research at the Epidepo Lab, which is a cooperation between George Washington University and CNRS. He is also a visiting professor in the Department of Physics at Georgetown University. Uh, Roland is a computational material scientist with a strong interest in the physics and mechanics of micro and nanoporous materials and confined fluids. Professor Plank's research is dedicated to the development of bottom-up simulation approaches, starting at the atomistic level of description for a large variety of critical problems in energy and environment. Ranging from hydrogen and methane storage, carbon dioxide sequestration, shale gas to fundamentals of cement and concrete research, and more recently on urban physics. Roland Plank is the author or co-author of more than 250 papers published in major peer-reviewed scientific journals. Professor Plank, it is an honor for me to introduce you today. We are so glad you could be here today to share your insights on how chemical defects influence charging of nanoporous carbon-based supercapacitors. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Yes, you sound great. Okay. <laughs> thank you for the introduction. It's, uh, Actually, a great pleasure to uh, to give this uh, micromerics seminars. Um, um, so I'm I'm phoning in from from France. So this is an afternoon here, and I hope for you. Uh, see, I guess for you it's a morning. Um, and uh, so um, to to give more insight about, I mean, so for me somehow this nano, I mean, this capacitance in nanopore carbon, so the super capacitor application is a new story based on very kind of. Uh, uh, sometimes somehow old concept in the sense that the description of what is an anoporous carbon has been in my kind of uh, realm for a long time. All right, so today I'm going first, um, I don't know, I have to thank my co-authors, which is Roman Dupuis and Katerina Yungu. They're both CNRS researchers in Montpellier, in France. And uh, we did that, that work, actually started at MIT where we were uh, together in this joint lab uh, between CNRS and MIT. And uh, the, the reason for that, actually, the context of that is that we got interested in, in porous carbon as reinforcement for, for cement, actually. But then on the path of doing that, we were saying, hey, what if we do a cement uh, supercapacitor? And so we did. We have a patent on that, actually. And the idea was then to understand the role of a, I mean, what is a super supercapacitor? And since we are like uh, people doing uh, experiments as much as we're doing simulations, we embarked into uh, trying to do a, a molecular simulation of, of, of uh, I mean, a supercapacitor based on uh, nanoporous carbon electrodes. Right, so I'm going to advance a bit the talk. So first, obviously, is to define what is a nanoporous carbon. And this is where the kind of story is kind of uh, all for me because I have been involved in developing nanoporous carbon models for 20 years now. And it all started with um, with some collaboration with Keith Gubbins uh, at North uh, Carolina, Carolina State University, where with um, with PhD uh, students, Jorge Piconic at the time, and Sawanda Jane, 
we developed this hybrid reverse Monte Carlo technique, which is a, a kind of um, a way to con- to construct a porous carbon out. I mean, you, you, I mean, trying to converge to a function that's given from experiment. In this case, is the pair correlation function that you can see at the bottom of the screen. That is actually the free transform of your say diffraction uh, signal that when you do x ray diffraction on, on a post carbon. So we move atom around so that you we agree with that function. Unfortunately, it happens that um, carbon did not they are not interact like strictly in a pairwise way. We have three uh, we, have, we have three body terms in the interaction. For instance, you know the sp two angle is between 120 angstrom uh, in graphene, uh, I mean a nine point something five in in in, in diamond and so on. So clearly there are three body contribution, and it means that we cannot just uh, converge. I mean by constraining the system to to a two body pair correlation function, such as the Georgiadis uh, function, if we transform of the diffraction signal, then. Uh, we need to also to implement some kind of covariance, co- so, some com- uh, some kind of treatment of the uh, description of the energy of the system, and that's where the hybrid term comes into the reverse Monte Carlo approach. So in this case, maybe you can read that the the, the, the equation at the bottom left, which is the probability of accepting a move of a carbon atom in a simulation box. Typically, we minimize not only the agreement uh, with the uh, Experimental function, the GRR function, which is the first term, chi square, uh, the difference of chi squares, but also we also minimize the energy, and that for that we need a, a some kind of uh, intermolecular treatment uh, of the interaction. So we, for that we use reactive force fields such as the rainbow potential, and more recently react FF. Uh, one thing is that in this technique we have to specify the composition right at the start, meaning that. We have a box, and we need to fill it up with the right amount of whatever, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on. At the time, we started with a pure carbon phase and enough oxygen, enough hydrogen to saturate that like that bonds. But obviously, uh, these days, we have moved uh, in collaboration, for instance, with uh, colleagues from Bordeaux, Jean-Marc Lestal, for instance. Uh, we have moved towards the description of uh, more realistic uh, carbon implementing the chemistry, and actually is very much at the core of um, this today's seminar. So say that we have a description, a way to produce a porous carbon. And a porous carbon with a density of one gram, 1.5 gram per, per, per centimeter cube is actually non-porous. And here you have two, two, two configurations. So the box size of those simulation uh, cells are five nanometers. And you can see on the left what we call CS1000A, which means uh, Sakharov's coke cooked at, at 1,000 C, and then activated. The A is for activated. So we have a very porous structure where you see the pores connected, and the pores are really in the range of one nanometer or less. And all the gray bonds are the kind of carbon-carbon distances. You don't see the hydrogen dangling bonds or oxygen later on the top, but they are, they, they, they are, the chemistry can be, can be in the box. On the right, you have a, 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 the same Sakharovskog 1,000 Kelvin uh, Celsius cooking temperature, but at a, temp- a density of 1.5 and not activated. And you can see that it's way denser. So steel is a porous carbon. You have pores, again, in the, in the range of uh, 1 nanometers, probably less, actually, between more like, uh, more like 7 angstrom, actually. And, uh, um, and what? Yes, and you can see that... Uh, we actually found subsequently, like recently in the work of uh, Amel Obligé at MIT with us, that if for those for denser porous carbons, actually the porosity is not, not much, not connected. So, and the threshold for that is 1.4 gram per centimeter cube. So even when you're above, the carbon is too dense, you are, yes, you have pores, but they're not necessarily connected. Why? At lower density, they are connected as shown on, on, on the left. If you look closer to the chemistry of those carbons, because we are using a reactive potential, that means that we have a way the carbon are doing bonding or bond breaking, bond forming, depending on the local environment. Uh, those carbon bonds are mostly to 90 plus percent uh, sp2 carbon. So you all, we all know what sp2 carbon means. It's graphene-like type of carbon, meaning that uh, a carbon atom has three neighbors, 
with a, an angle uh, between the, the, the three atoms, three carbon atoms of 120 uh, degrees. So that's an important uh, com uh, consequence in the sense that if you look up in graphene, for instance, graphene is a semi-metal. Somehow it does conduct, it does conduct electricity of, as well, uh, very well. Um, by contrast, those carbon actually are, I mean, not as good as conductors. I'll come back to that later on. But yes, those, those carbons are also conducting electricity, electrons, for the good reason of those sp2 carbons. All right, let's move on. And the next slide is actually the density of state. I know for if uh, uh, the audience is familiar with the concept, this is the histogram of the, all the electron states in the system. So this is just a distribution of the of the of the, the uh, occupied on on not occupied orbitals in the molecular orbitals of the system issues. We did that in the tight binding approximation. Uh, that binding is a cheap quantum way to do the. It's a, it's a way to do a, a cheap way to do quantum calculation, meaning that the calculation itself is restricted only to two p electrons. Um, for carbon, obviously the one is electron for hydrogen. So in the end, you have those uh, two p two those uh, external uh, outside electron, if you wish, for the carbon that are bonded to a core that contains the inner electrons and the the, the nuclei of, of carbon. So there are some kind of uh, coupling constants for the selector orbital uh, selector integrals in there, so that uh, people have calculated those uh, for, for for carbon, for instance. So if we do the calculation on the, 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 the bottom uh, plot here for graphene, at uh, the family level, the family level is the, 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 the kind of the limit, the, 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 the most uh, energy that you can get for occupied orbitals. And you can see, uh, um, you can see that at the family level, this is the vertical line, we have a kind of a V shape there. This is characteristic of, of, of actually graphene. If we now do the same kind of calculation for uh, those porous carbon on the top, so CS1000, CS1000, 1000A on the right. At the family level, the dashed vertical line, you can see that we don't have this V shape. We have a, a, a very like populated um, kind of um, density of states and with peaks. And actually, those peaks actually reflect um, a very important phenomenon, is, is the charge localization. Meaning that as soon as we introduce disorder in the system, we start localizing electrons. Obviously, localizing, localizing electrons means that those, guys, those electrons are not very available for conduction. Right? So clearly, those porous carbon are less conducting than, than, than gra gra graphene. They are still conducting, though, but 1,000 times less. Right? And those, those states at the family level, okay, we can actually uh, kind of sort them uh, for those that correspond to orbitals that are attached to some carbon, sp2 carbons, for instance, or other carbons, from defective carbons, for instance, non-sp2 could be anything else, could be sp3 carbons, such as in diamonds, it could be carbon linked to hydrogen, and we can also sort for hydrogen. And actually, if we kind of, re, um, kind of look the contribution to density of state at the family level, uh, coming from the SP, the pure sp2 carbon, then we can have we can have actually an idea of the conduction in a kind of free electron approximation, which is uh, uh, maybe a way. I mean, it's, it's a way to to tell you that yes, those porous carbon actually do do conduct electron, and again, not as much, not as well as as, as graphite or graphene. All right, next, next, as I said, those porous carbons are porous. Okay. Let's see the, the pore size distribution here, and you can see they expand a region between five to nine angstrom, right? So mostly around like five, seven angstrom. So meaning that it, when it comes down to uh, storing like ions and water, well, those pores cannot uh, cannot have too many uh, occupants, right? In the sense that it's probably uh, maybe one water molecule, or maybe two, or maybe one ion, and so on. All right, so we don't expect much of uh, a bug phase in those pores. And that's actually slides that you're getting for me um, to accommodate the developers I had in the past with Taylor, who actually worked for Micromedics for, for, for many years, who's now a pretty retired uh, since a few months, I think. Um, and we actually show that uh, the post distribution has gotten from DFT calculation, DFT, the thermal element, thermal element DFT calculation, um, uh, when we do, for instance, adoption experiments. I think they agree pretty well 
with those uh, when we calculated straight from our models. So that was kind of a surprise, despite all approximation in terms of volume, I mean, pore shape, and so on, and so on, how many layers of graphene, and so on. And then it works pretty, pretty, pretty well. So we have a sub nanoporous carbon, actually, in this case. And as a characterization and also a way to, to actually check how good we are in terms of uh, texture, one way to do that is to, to, to characterize, I mean, to do adsorption. So we characterize the, the, the carbon from, from its pores, pore system. So in the past, that appears here from Bouchard in 2012, we did actually, actually a grand canonical simulations of adsorption of methane and, for instance, CO2 and later on water, as you could see, you will see. And here we can see that with no approximation, we kind of refine pretty well the experiment from uh, Otidier and um, uh, professors, uh, Professor uh, um, at, at ETH Zurich, which is uh, like, like a, a, a good a good way to say that we're good in terms of texture somehow. For instance, in case of methane, we have a type 1 hydro, adsorption hydrotherm as expected. And for, for, for CO2, also the same, but you know, as, as you know, uh, experiment measures the excess adsorption of the term, and so we can we could correct the simulation for for the excess, so that we can compare what it exp what is actually comparable. You see, at low temperature, there's no much of uh, interest in doing that. The excess is, is negligible, but at like, large temperature, for, for, for instance, in this case, the case of CO2, uh, that the way to do with, with experiment is to correct the CMC for the excess, and we can straight compare with with the with the experiment and what we covered the dumb uh, the dumb shell shape of the adsorption hydrogen. On the right, uh, I shall come back to, to that from the next slide, more details, but they see the heat of adsorption as measured, for instance, from calorimetry, um, adiabatic calorimetry. So that's actually the, input, the increase of energy that's released to the outside, because this adsorption is an exothermic process. Um, for every time uh, pl uh, plus one molecule enters enters the system. So obviously, the filling fraction of zero is really when one one single methane of CO2 molecule is entering the pore. So it is really a probe of the deepest site at equilibrium that we expect the molecule to have, to have found the, deep, the deepest uh, energy site in the system. So this is a real way to kind of uh, say, okay, um, we have a uh, kind of uh, a strong affinity of the substrate. Of the, of the molecule to the substrate. In this case, for instance, we have a heat of adsorption of methane, which is like in the range of, I don't know, 18, 20 kilo, 20 or 18, or, uh, yes, a little more. And that is typically way more than, for instance, the heat of liquefaction of, of methane. Same for, for, um, for CO2. I'm advancing down to the next slide because it's the same curve that we actually did for, for, um, for argon in the sports carbon, CS1000, and for once, actually, we did the simulation before the experiment, so there was a real prediction somehow. So we did that for different type of description of, uh, sorry, it was nitrogen, for different description of nitrogen, we did that for carbon too, uh, we, and we compared with the experiment run by Philippe Leoulin. He was a, now his colleague now is the, the, the Mr. CO2 with Total uh, Energies uh, company in, in, in France, which is the largest uh, oil company in France, and at the time, with that, that I mean, not only the comparison with the experiment was interesting because it was, a, it was actually a prediction for once, but also the shape that we understand this decreasing function. And in that is very important because that single sh curve tells you that in no way uh, a porous carbon is uh, behaving like graphite or graphene for adsorption. Why is that? It's because actually uh, if you were to have a kind of a very nice flat surface of graphene, you expect to have very homogeneous adsorption size everywhere. So meaning the first argon atom we come in there, we measure one energy. But the second one, we measure the second, the, the same energy. So twice the same energy divided by two is still constant. So for graphene, we expect actually that the adsorbate uh, nitrogen or the adsorbate argon contribution will be constant. And obviously, as the adsorption process proceeds, the molecule-molecule uh, interaction is increasing. So on the top, we have a flat function, person equal function for graphene, and we should expect an increasing total uh, signal, which is not the case in porous carbon. Why is that? It's because the, 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 the mass or the disorder of the porous stru structure texture itself induces a, a very rough or heterogeneous um, landscape of, of energy in terms of uh, adsorption energy. So... 
that's a second reason to tell you that a porous carbon is not not to stop graphene. And obviously, when it turns to uh, all this disorder, I'm saying, if we kind of characterize it even more with a adsorbent such as water, that is very sensitive to the defect because we expect the defect this is where 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 the charge where the electrons will accumulate due to the bonding, right? So that you see that the the, the 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 water molecule, for instance, will agglomerate around a oxygen defect in the porous carbon, while methane molecule, for instance, there in this uh, mixture simulation done by Laurent Bouchard many years ago, uh, in 2012, I think, uh, don't care. I mean, so you see that actually, the, in the end, you can see that we, with respect to some uh, uh, to water, for instance, the defects do play a very much a role into the sports carbon that's actually known to be hydrophobic, but this hydrophobic CT depends very much on how much chemistry you have in uh, in, in, in the system, by chemistry, I mean non-carbon ions, so the amount typically of oxygen, of oxygen-containing groups in the porous carbon. And obviously, we can go from hydrophobic to hydrophilic, depending on the amount of those effects on the texture. So, again, a disorder, in this case, you can see that we have the feeling as two components. There is a, what I call a topological disorder, which is everything that is not, if it is carbon, but not SP2 carbon. Okay, so locally we may have some benzene kind of covering like uh, structures. But yeah, but those, those regions will be uh, so with some boundaries in which you have all sorts of, of those topos, topological defects. So non carbon, but non not purely SP2 carbon. But then we have also the chemistry uh, defects like OH groups. And altogether, that obviously you have, we have the feeling that it drives that this drives the absorption. But if we are to provide this electron, this, 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 this medium, this porous carbon uh, in a supercapacitor uh, device, we expect already that those defects will play a role because they will accumulate charges or, I mean, excess or defects of charges, obviously. All right, let's move on and go uh, to supercapacitors. Uh, that's a kind of uh, a, a, uh, the usual uh, kind of picture of supercapacitors. We have an electrode. Anode, the electrode, okay, and the cathode electrode in between you have an electrolyte and you polarize this with some voltage. So you are flowing electron out of the anode and pouring electron in the cathode in there and you can see charge accumulation. So the, the, the minus charge, the minus ions in from the electrolyte accumulate on the plus uh, electrode in the anode and the other side you have the plus ion accumulate on the negative electrode. So that's the usual thing. But the question is, how much does it work with, with the pores carbon? How does iron actually get into the pores, depending if they are uh, chlorine or, or, or sodium ions? So this is typically what we're going to investigate. So this is typically our setup, simulation setup. So we have actually uh, are two pores carbon, as you can see in gray. In between, we have an electrolyte, meaning water molecules, explicit water molecules, and sodium in blue and chlorine in orange. Ions and the whole idea is, as a function of voltage, uh, the whole idea is to describe the, the, how those ions get to the outside surface and eventually get into the porosity. So we did the calculation with the LAMPS code, which is an academic code. I mean, open to academics simulation code. We use a compact force field, which is not not reactive in the sense of uh, bond breaking, bond forming. And by the way, the carbon positions are frozen, so only the water and the ion can move. Altogether, it's a 50,000 um, atoms uh, simulation at room temperature, and the concentration in between of the ion is about 0.7 molar uh, um, at start before polarization. Um, as you can see, I see we're using periodic, periodic boundary conditions all, I mean, in all directions, so we're not simulating only two electrodes, actually, we're simulating a stack of electrodes, obviously. All right, so there we go. And then we have to go now to statistical physics. Because when simulation, at some point, the machinery behind is statistical physics. And okay, so now we are, we are bound to speak about uh, simulation, uh, about statistical physics and samples. And if you look up uh, the idea of polarize, polarizing the system, meaning that you inject elect charges, electrons in one or remove from, from in one electrode or remove charges from the other electrode, we are bound to kind of to, 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 to do two kinds of simulation. Either it's called constant voltage simulation or constant charge simulation. 
But as you know, the, the physics doesn't depend on the way you do the simulation. Just, just the, the ensemble tells you what you can calculate as an ensemble average. For instance, for instance uh, and um, if I fix the volume of a cell, I can calculate the pressure as an ensemble average. Reciprocally, if I fix the pressure, I can calculate the volume as an ensemble average. In this case, we're going to do constant number of whatever, molecules or ions, water molecules, ions, constant carbon. We're going to do constant volume constant temperature, and for instance here, constant voltage simulation, which means that we can, for instance, calculate the charge as a ensemble average, okay? And that was my, actually um, my, my door into the field of doing supercapacitor simulation back in some kind of, uh, some maybe 10 years ago now, and looking at the work of this uh, key, uh, key, key Charles, um, a paper in the chem fees back in 2007 where they were showing um, a way to do a constant voltage simulation uh, using Monte Carlo techniques. So the other probability here, which is the minimum of one exponential and so on. So what the idea is that at every Monte Carlo step, basically you compare this exponential term uh, with a random number taken between zero and one, and you move the atom if this exponential term is larger than the random number um, that, that you have. So in the end, we do Monte Carlo, but you see that exponential term contains two terms. There, there, there is first the delta U, which is the, the potential energy, and also a term that is actually um, you describe the charging process where sigma is the charge and actually delta phi is actually the V. This is the difference of potential between the two electrodes. And H2 is a coupling constant. So at the end of the day, KT, T, T, K is a plus one constant, T is the temperature. So at the end of the day, there is a way to kind of do this constant charge, uh, constant voltage. So for fixed delta phi, we can calculate uh, sigma uh, as, as, as an ensemble average. So we, we tried that thing to the porous carbon. And this is what we got in, and which is not super good in the sense that in the end, okay, with or without electrolyte, or say that we're looking at the charge of the porous carbon, and you can see that the porous cell porous carbon across the electrode is, all, is almost zero, except mostly for the atoms at the outside surface, where it gets more negative, as this is all, uh, actually, I should have written this. This is under the, the polarization of one volt. Um, on the right, you can see the same plot uh, over time, the fluctuation, and you can see that uh, implementing the charge, I mean, pl 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 let, let, letting the ion get into the pores, uh, I should just damp a bit the fluctuations of uh, uh, those, those kind of charge fluctuation, but still you can see that there is not much of uh, kind of, uh, I mean, there's not change the picture on the charge localization, which occurs only on the outside surface. I mean, mostly on the outside surface of the electrode. And the direct consequence of that is that we see only adsorption of ions on the outside electrode. So in the end, I don't know if you see the, if you can see the, the, the conclusion of the, of the slide, but the pore don't dock any ions in, 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 their, in the, the, the pore. The, the electrode don't, don't dock any ions in the, in the nanopores. Um, but this is very annoying because actually, um, you know, the term supercapacitor, as compared to capacitor, comes from the fact that people are using porous electrodes, and those pores are actually able to store more iron than uh, just a non-porous electrode. So you see, that with the constant voltage simulation, we have a problem because we, although we have porous system for sure, we are not docking any ions into them. All right. So that's clearly an outcome. I mean. The pores of this side, okay, uh, of, of less than one nano. That's a real problem, actually. Now, if I go to the other way to do uh, a polarization in statistical physics, there will be constant charge simulation. So that is what, in this case, we actually fix a charge on every atom. Every carbon has the same charge, okay, so that we can actually come back to uh, calculating the voltage, all right, as an ensemble average. But the, the thing is that uh, if we fix it, there's not much uh, voltage to fluctuate, but what the, the drawback of that constant charge technique is that we see no ion outside now. They're all inside the pores, right? And so much inside that actually they want to, for instance, the sodium ion to benefit, to, to, to interact more with the negative carbon ion in this electron, because this is a minus electrode, and you can see that they sit in the middle of the electrode. And the same for the chlorine ion, they enter the pores and they sit in the middle. So as far as they can of the, of the same side, same sign electrode on the other side, and as much as they can inside the electrode to, to benefit from the interaction. 
with the opposite side of the problem, atoms. So in this case, we actually losing the whole uh, idea of an electro electrical double layer uh, supercapacitor, which means that typically people have measured the fact that still you have ions on the outside surface that form this electrical double layer, this EDL, and also a contribution from the pores. So we have a problem because we cannot simulate properly a, simulate, uh, a supercapacitor. So let's get back to chemistry because at the end of the day, everything starts from chemistry. And get back to a very simple case. For instance, um, this paper that I like very much, that is about looking at graphene. So we come back to very graphene flakes, actually. And in this calculation, this is a quantum uh, DFT calculation, so the quantum DFT, sorry, and to analyze where the electrons go and sit. Actually, it was done for pure carbon flakes with hydrogen on the outside. You see the, the blue carbon are the defective carbon in the sense that they are linked to hydrogens. And you have three cases. The middle case is the normal case where uh, every, I mean, there is the, norm, the, the right amount, uh, amount of electrons per, per, per carbon atoms. On the left, we, they, we are, the people, in the, those, those authors, they have had one, uh, one, one more electron to the system. On the right, they remove it. So they're charging the system. And guess what, actually? And you see that the picture doesn't change too much when you charge the system. What is changing is maybe the color code where they, like, they, 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 the blue gets more blue when there is more electron, less blue when there is less electron. But what matters here is that those charging process actually concern the atoms that are defective. Defective in the sense not purely sp2 carbon as the white ones. Okay, the defective are in this case first row on the edges, and for the the the, the middle row and the bottom one, actually um, the, those authors have kind of implemented on the top of uh, the finite size of the of the flake, which introduces by itself defects. They have introduced chemistry, in the sense of of uh, of uh, nitrogen atoms or boron atoms. And you can see, uh, again, from uh, the minus and the plus case, that actually uh, the charge sit very close by uh, the defective species. All right, so that's a very, very interesting for us. So we did a bit of DFT calculation on our porous carbon. Oh, yeah, of course, mean this, but you see that the main bar corresponds to actually um, uh, the carbon that have almost a zero charge, and uh, you are, with the defect induces some atoms. You will see the tail of the distribution uh, that are actually non non-zero, non, non and that corresponds to the non-SP2 carbon. So the, the central bars correspond to the SP2 carbons. Now I want to tell you that um, the, the system is, is this: uh, the electrode thickness is about two nanometers, meaning that now we have because of the the, the, the two outside charges. Now we have 70% of the atoms are sp2 carbons and 30 percent that are actually defective meaning that is a defect inside the electrode or a defect on the outside because of the cutting of the outside surface and obviously they have those are occurring some hydrogen atoms for instance okay so we have uh, we propose what we call the chemistry driven charge localization the cdcl approach that's a way to combine both ways in more um, to, to, to give an account of the charging process in, in those defective system, porous carbon defective uh, systems, in the sense that everything that is not sp2 will receive a, a charge, for instance, or a defect of charge, depends if you are polarizing plus or, or, or minus. And the amount of that will be proportional to how far we are from being of the, this carbon being from purely sp2. And that we quantify that through the angle distribution. You see that mostly of the carbon are the angle distribution between them of 120 degrees. And we give we give this actually rule, a very simple rule, which is this linear dependence, this equation that's written there. Um, um, that report the way the, the atom charge. So at some point there will be a maximum uh, when we go in. So we move from zero to some charge uh, according to how bad we. I mean. To the, to the how the state of the carbon atoms in the sense of being sp2 or far from being sp2 or less far from being sp2. Well, this work was published like this year, at the beginning of the year, uh, in PNAS actually. So with that CDCL technique, then we run the simulation. First, we can look at the, the charges. Actually, this is the, the zero volts, so the non-polarized electrodes. You see the charge on the hydrogen atoms out of our kind of calculation. This is uh, from the potential thing that we have. So we have obviously the same uh, charge because we have the same electrodes. 
and the zero hour indicates the red hour indicates zero charge. So you see that okay, mostly the carbon atoms are carrying a negative charge, right? And the hydrogen, the oxygen, mostly a positive charge. Zero polarization. Now we move to two volts, which is way large. Oh, the uh, <laughs> the carbon atoms has disappeared. Anyway, you have to believe me. So everything, I mean, on the positive, uh, on the anode, everything is kind of shifted uh, plus, and uh, for the cathode, everything is shifted towards more negative, and that's the, as, a, as, as a result of, of the polarization. So I'm sorry about this uh, graph disappearing. Okay. Anyway. So now, if we run the simulation, first we're gonna we did a little checking. So instead of running an NVT constant uh, charge, because now the charges are constant, but they are not the same everywhere. Overall, the, the charging is process is this, uh, it, we distribute a fixed amount of charge, but not the same on every carbon atom. The more defective receive more charges or more defect of charge depending on the on the electrode polarization. Okay. But before going to the full simulation, we did an NVE calculation at, with the constant charge distribution, with, the, with those charge distribution, just to check out that the temperature in the system was actually constant and fixed to room temperature. And this is what we have gotten right there, just to, to check that everything was behaving okay in terms of uh, uh, thermalization of, of, of the system. All right, so now going back to NVT. Uh, constant charge simulation, and again, the constant charge doesn't mean that all atoms are the same charge, solid atoms, carbon atoms. No, they now they have a, a charge that depends where how defective they are in terms of being or more or less sp2 carbon. The sp2 carbon don't have any charge. So we we, we can see from there that um, that, that the electrode at work in a charge, so zero volt and one volt, as you can see, um, everything uh, in. Uh, all the ions are outside, obviously, in the in the bulk electrolyte. And uh, after at equilibrium, over under one volt, you can see that some ions, so the blue are the sodium ion, the orange are will be the chlorine ions, are entered the electrodes, obviously. All right, so that's clearly the um, the uh, the idea. So you can see the polarization effect. So the gray region represents the, the electrode, and you see that the minus electrode. Uh, uh, welcomes obviously the plus ions on the right, and the plus electrode of the steam ion welcomes minus electrode on the left, the chlorine ions in orange. All right, let's move on. And now we are actually uh, the, the full picture, meaning that uh, if I go back here, you can see that we not only we absorb inside the gray, uh, the, the gray region, which is inside the electrodes, but we also have ions distributing on the outside. So we have this combined and expected behavior of a supercapacitor. Uh, as being a, 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 a uh, uh, as having an a, a ADL, a double layer uh, uh, um, of ion building up on the outside of the pore. So we combine the two effects, the, in, the blocking inside the pores and the building up of the double layer on the outside, as you can see from this density plot. All right, so now if I go to uh, analyzing the potential created um, on the outside surface and the way that the ion distribute, that is actually um, uh, the Dubaikal theory, which is a linear version of the Poisson Boltzmann theory, but okay. And at the end, we can see that the simulation we find pretty well the, 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 the theory as predicted by the Dubai Huckel. And, and if you look at the Dubai uh, equation, which is the, 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 the top one, actually, you can see that it's, it, is, it contains what's called the Dubai length, okay, screening length. And that device screening length, actually, we can, eva uh, we can actually evaluate it to two to three to maybe two point something angstrom, so between two and three angstrom, and that corresponds exactly for the for the for the concentration of um, of, of of ions in between the electrodes. So we are doing okay in terms of the electrical double layer. Now, moving on to the actual uh, uh, performance of this supercapacitor. Uh, are we good with experiments? So that we, we're going to, to calculate what's called the capacitance. Capacitance means this is the amount of ion basically getting docked into the electrode. So the, the sodium in the minus electrode, the chlorine in the plus electrode, as a function of the voltage or as a function of the charging of the carbon atoms. And again, remember that in the CDCL approach, the carbon atoms have a different charge if they are like defects or, or sp2 carbon, basically. 
And we get this curve with this uh, kind of uh, maximum here. And as we increase the voltage, it decreases. And that is a very, and a very easy to understand that because we get the ion in, in, the, in, the, in the system. And actually, the capacitance is the, the number of ions divided by the, by the voltage. So at some point, we reach a maximum and we keep increasing the voltage. So, so that number of the capacitance decreases. That is what we get. And interestingly enough, remember that in the constant voltage calculation, we couldn't get any ion inside, right? So if we compare the constant voltage, that these are the three dots with the, 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 the line, the black line, at the maximum, the red region corresponds really too much, very much to, to, the, to the contribution of the porosity of the carbon to the capacitance. And in straight numbers, you see that typically the, the outside will be 80% and the inside will be around, uh, around 20%. So that, I mean, Actually, in action numbers, um, the, 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 the capacitance that we get is 100 and something uh, farad per gram, and 20% is due to the, to the nanoporosity. 80% is actually due to the outside electrical double, la double layer forming. And uh, this is pretty close to the experiment, which is reported for this kind of pore carbon around 100. Okay? Now, final comment. It's, if we keep increasing the potential, the electrical polarization, the difference of potential between the two electrodes, Actually, we reach a condition where actually we're going to break the water molecule. It's called water splitting. But in our description, we cannot do, uh, see that because the water is not able to break. The water is an unbreakable body. In this case, still we describe it as H2O, but uh, we cannot break the bond. So it's not reactive in the sense for water. And this blue region at the one, one point something volt will typically correspond to this water splitting potential. I shall come back to this point at the end in my final comment about electrocatalysis. Now we can actually dig into, into more the mechanism of this uh, ion absorbing on the outside and absorbing uh, and finally docking into the pores. First, remember that we are simulating the same electrodes, right? So this is called a symmetrical capacitor, supercapacitor. Very good. Yes, we are doing a symmetrical supercapacitor, but we actually see an asymmetrical behavior of, of the, 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 the ionic species, meaning that the way ions, uh, sodium, absorb and diffuse into the electrode is different than that of chlorine ions. Why is that? It's actually linked to the fact that um, both they have an hydration shell, so a number of water molecules in the bulk, and remember that the pores are very small. So actually... Um, this is the, the bottom plot, actually, if you are to monitor the, the number of water molecules attached to uh, uh, those ions, in sodium or chlorine ions through the simulation and average uh, on them, you can see that they enter the pores with barely no water molecules. All right, so that we have naked ions. So at some point, it should be a place where those, the hydration shell of those ions breaks. And you understand now that obviously the chlorine ion being a bigger, a bigger guy, okay, the hydration shell is less tight compared to, to, to the sodium case, which is a smaller ion, so the hydration shell is actually, uh, the bottom molecules are closer, there is more energy in there. So in fact, what's happening is that the chlorine ions actually are losing their, their, their water shell more easily, more easily than the sodium ions. So they go to the surface and they find their way into the pores. But they are bigger guys, so they, they, they manage their way into the pores before the sodium ions who accumulate on the outside surface, and it takes some more energy, some more voltage to for to lose the, the to lose to loosen the the, the, the the hydration shell of sodium ions so that those guys can actually get free in some ways and get into the pores. So this is why we think this asymmetrical behavior that is reflected in the different curves, for instance, you have uh, through time. So orange is always the cation, the chlorine ions, the blue, the sodium, black is total. And you see that the docking is, 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 is kind of very, kind of, uh, is not symmetric in, in time. Now at the equilibrium of our voltage, which is the plot on the right, you can see uh, the difference, I mean, the accumulation of iron, of, of the blue ion at the outside surface, and then they get into the pores. Uh, but that, that obviously, um, this is not the case of chlorine ion that you get into the pores faster. And finally, uh, we actually did the uh, cycling, meaning that we polarize electrodes and unpolarize electrodes, go back to zero poles. And actually, we actually lost about 10% of the atoms that remain actually trapped into the electrodes. And we did three cycles of this uh, cycling for now, uh, with this rigid electrode where the atom, the carbon atoms kind of move. 
And uh, okay, this is a constant that, that we are kind of lost forever <laughs> in some ways. With those 10% of ions, in the sense that they are they are contributing to capacitance, but they are not they cannot get out, meaning that they are lost in terms of uh, of being I mean participating to the supercapacitor divide uh, per se, right? All right, so that's really much the uh, the mechanism. So uh, yes, asymmetrical supercapacitor, but actually very asymmetrical behavior of the electrode, and that was actually this asymmetrical behavior was actually measured not in the case of an electrolyte, uh, aqueous electrolyte, but for those um, uh, what's called uh, uh, ionic uh, ionic fluid uh, systems from from enamel. All right, and this is my, I guess, my last last slide. It was next, actually, and this is a movie that Roman uh, just has given to me. I don't know if it's going to work, but is that movie working or not? Probably does not. Okay, fine. Um, so the idea was to come back to uh, constant voltage simulations, and the idea is that we now we have a fully reactive potential, like we have KFF, and, and on also a better description of the chemistry, meaning that we have now configuration of atoms, thanks to Jean-Marc Lessal, my colleague from from, from, uh, from uh, Institute of Molecular Science in, in, in Bordeaux, in the west of France. Uh, we have different configuration of, of carbon with different amounts of oxygen, so we're going to see how much of the oxygen, I mean, that contributes. Obviously, you understand there's a trade-off there, because the, oxygen, the more defect we localize, more the charges, so the ion might get easier inside the pore. But too much of defect means that we're going to lose the conductivity, and the non-conductive electrode is not going to do a good supercapacitor. So there, clearly there's a trade-off there that we need to investigate how much defect can stand an electrode, uh, kind of where is the optimum into charge docking, so increasing capacitance and losing the conductivity, the electron conductivity. And again, kind of this, and this is what Romain is doing right now, it's investigating the different type of, 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 of ions, for instance, the, the uh, Na+, plus potassium, cesium series, and uh, leaving the, the, the possibility of the carbon atoms to move around so that the pore can actually uh, breathe. So that opens several um, routes of investigation in the sense that we're going to see how those um, uh, cesium atoms, for instance, those big ions can get into the pore because they do get into pores. Um, and, and, and that also allows us to, to do the, uh, an aging process with the electrode, seeing that maybe the, electrode will, the carbon atoms will get, not get back to the original position so that we see a pore mechanics uh, taking place under the condition of polarization. And now this is my, maybe my final comment in the sense that if we go, since we can now, we have this reactive potential, we are kind of hopefully good enough to describe bond breaking, bond forming in the system, not only for the for the couple of electrodes, hopefully not, but clearly for the water molecules. So meaning that if we go above the water splitting potential, then we can expect to see the formation, you know, for instance, of H2, the reduction of CO2 in the pores, and so on, studying, for instance, this oxygen evolution reaction or the hydrogen evolution evolution reaction. All right, so uh, that was the latest for the future, and this is what we want to do. And, uh, and I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Roland. Uh, I'm opening the chat for everyone's questions now, and we already have a few. Um, earlier in your presentation, you, you discussed the reverse Monte Carlo for uh, describing the for synthesizing the structure. Um, do you yep. use the same tool set for reverse Monte Carlo that you use later on um, in these models where you use lamps? Yes, actually, yes. It's, uh, this is actually implementing in lamps. Yes, we, I mean, we implement so the one is on version of lamps. But, okay, so we did implement this reverse Monte Carlo uh, technique in, in, in lamps, yes. So, well, actually, uh, this is the, the hybrid with Monte Carlo. Right? So we, we're minimizing the agreement towards the, the pair correlation function and the minimizing at the same time the energy. Uh, and, and also, you showed very nicely the different uh, heats of adsorption for CO2 and uh, methane yeah. on these different materials. Uh, do you also have an estimate for water on some of these materials? Yes, yes, we do. I don't have the slide right there, but yes, we did actually. That's, uh, maybe that this is the work of Laurent, Laurent Bouchard. He was a PhD with me and a postdoc with us at MIT. Uh, 
Well, I, I know that um, we did subsequently, actually, we used that same reverse Monte Carlo technique, hybrid reverse Monte Carlo, to study kerogen, you know, in the context of shell gas. And uh, Laurent did a lot of work of uh, how much water gets into those pores. So at the end of the day, uh, very much your kerogen is the same kind of coarse carbons. So, yes, we did the water study today. Yeah. Um, it, in this work um, with the simulation um, and the charging, do you see an optimal pore size for the chlorine um, versus the sodium? Or in in general, what, what's the approximate? You know, what would you estimate is the optimal size? So, so uh, clearly, yeah. Okay, don't forget for the for the one I've shown today, the carbon uh, atoms were fixed in position, right? So the, the electrode cannot breathe, if you like. Okay. So yes, and we could see the chlorine ion get into the pore faster in time than sodium ion because of the, the adjacent shell uh, stability of sodium is larger than that of, of chlorine ions. But clearly the chlorine ions are bigger ions and they diffuse very, I mean, not so much inside the electrodes. I mean, yes, they do get in the room, but say they, they diffuse within one nanometer away maybe uh, from, the, from the outside surface. You see, while the sodium ion clearly uh, can probe more, 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 more the, the porosity. That with, that's the picture with frozen atoms. So more recently, um, Romain did some cesium calculation. And to our surprise, we were seeing cesium ion, that it, because of the breathing of the, you know, uh, we, we let the atom, carbon atoms to move in the simulation. So that induces some kind of breathing of the, of the electrode. And yes, the, so, the cesium atoms, which, which, is, which is a pretty big atom, could get into the pore. So I think, at the end of the day, uh, it will be very interesting and maybe crucial to let uh, to allow the, 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 the breathing of, of the electrodes to understand well uh, the docking of, of different ions in the pores. So to answer your question, for now in the rigid situation, uh, the, the optimum pore size is really on the, I mean, this five, seven nanometers is really uh, in the favor of sodium ions more than chlorine ions. Uh, but who knows with, uh, if we allow uh, the ions to, I mean, the carbon atoms to, to move. Um, you, you, talk, you, you describe really nicely about where things are distributed versus when they're in sub-nanopores or on the uh, outside external surface. Um, mm -hmm. At what pore size does it become effective to have a double layer? So well, the double layer, I mean, oh, yeah, so I mean, in between the electrode, the distance between the electrode, yeah? that's what you mean. Yeah? Yeah. The, the, the pore size in terms of the distance between the electrode and the outside. Yeah. So here we have, uh, uh, I think, the, the, the distance were like a couple of nanometers. So that's enough um, to remember that we have this, uh, the Bayuco profile. Um, uh, so that's the potential, the, the electrical potential is a function of the distance away from the surface. And with this Dubai uh, length, the by length of two, three angstroms. So it tells you that uh, this is within the few, uh, the few first angstroms. So you can allow the, 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 the distance between the electrodes to be in a, in a one, two nanometers. And still, you will have uh, a double layer there. Uh, now, the question is now if we get too, too close of the electrodes, so that will be maybe the packing of the electrodes. And don't forget that in the real case, we need to have a, uh, what's called a separator between the electrodes. So this is a separator is something that is non conducting electron, otherwise we have a short circuit between electron the electrode inside the device, the, the supercapacitor device. So a separator is a porous non conducting interface. Like whatever. It could be actually kitchen tower actually. And it works with that actually. So, uh, so at the end uh, of the day, I think just because of the presence of that, actually, we, we have, um, I don't know how, uh, if a double layer can be built with a one nano distance. Maybe yes, maybe not, I don't know. But clearly, clearly there should be a distance between, the, you know, uh, in this outside situation where something will interact. We, I mean, we're not building a nice uh, Dubai Uka layer anymore. Um, in your study, what is the hybridization of the defective carbons? Oh, okay. So the, the because of the two external surfaces, there are like seventy percent of the carbons are sp two carbons. Clearly, sp two carbon with a neighbor mm -hmm. between three of them of hundred and coming near neighbors of the thing uh, of, of one hundred and twenty degrees. 
So meaning that still there are, because of the signals electrode, there are 30% of defective. But those defects are obviously out, due to the, to, to the outside surface that carry, uh, where the atoms carry some hydrogen atoms and whatever chemistry, but also inside. So and the, the, obviously we we see um, we see most of the most of the defects are actually on the outside. Okay. Um, we we often have this uh, common question because, uh, it, as you're well aware, we've got this confusion in uh, language often about micropores, mesopores, macropores, oh, yes. anopores. Um, yes. In your study, uh, someone asks about, you know, can you comment a little bit about the size range that you're referring to when you discuss sub-nanopores? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I mean, clearly, so I have to tell you something. I spent many years, including MIT, like 12 years or more, discussing with, with mechanicians. And for when you say micro to mechanician, they understand micron. So it was really annoying, uh, this kind of shift of language. So that's why me, I'm talking about nanopores, all right, when it is in the nano range. And I'm talking about sub-nanopores when it's less than one nano, which is the case of those porous carbons. It does not mean that there is no other pores than sub-nanopores in porous carbon, but we're just saying that uh, with, with this kind of reverse Monte Carlo technique, hybrid reverse Monte Carlo, in a box of five nanometer in size, we describe the sub nanoporosity of, of the, the pores carbon. There are bigger pores, but clearly uh, what matters for adoption, as you know, uh, or for the docking of those ions to get the supercapacitor, uh, let's say, power, um, it, the, the, this, is, this is related to, to the, the presence of those sub nanopores. So sub nano meaning less than one nano. Great, thank you. Um, for some of the uh, experimental work that uh, you, you reference in here, uh, do you know what do you know what tool they used uh, to quantify some of the defects in those nanoporous carbons? Oh yeah, so so the um, what they do uh, so typically, you know, there is a, a, an easy recipe is I mean two ways actually I mean at least two ways. Either you do this kind of dosing of uh, you know with some reactant. Uh, whatever, methylene blue or something, that's a way to get to know the type and the amount of defects in the porous carbon. The other G way will be to do infrared. So infrared, you look not in the phonon region, but really in the high frequency uh, region, you look at uh, the vibrations and they are like the uh, identity identity card or the uh, yes the idea of uh, of the type of bond you have in the system. So that's a way, and then you have a signal that when you do in in in, in reflectivity, that then you have to say the the number of those defects will be the integral of uh, of a peak. All right, in this representation. So this is uh, that's it. that's maybe the way to quantify uh, the, the the better with the better precision the amount of defects. Um, but typically, in terms of quantity, uh, we expect uh, the percentage of oxygen within to be oxygen containing group being in the range of a few percent. Typically, in actually natural carbons, like very mature natural carbon, meaning like very old carbons, like carogen in the ground and so on, it's less than, could be um, less than 1%. Uh, and the really question, as I said at the conclusion, is how much defect an electrode can stand? Because again, the, the, the defect localizes uh, pack of electrons or defect of electrons, depending on the polarization, before losing conductivity, electron conductivity, because uh, again, an electrode has to conduct electron in the first place, right? So, and uh, I was discussing that with a colleague in, in London, Teresa, Professor Teresa Bandos, and while well, this is an ongoing discussion we're having together, is uh, it's probably a few percent that will be the, the, the uh, where, I mean, let's say 5%, say, where an electrode will lose uh, its conductivity. This is my guess for now, but this is what we are investigating right now, actually. Um, that's all the questions we have time for today. Uh, if we haven't been right. able to get to your questions, one of our application team will be in touch shortly. Uh, Roland, is there anything else you'd like to mention today? That was a pleasure uh, talking to you, Jeff, and talking to, to my comrades. 
Um, I hope to see you in real sometime in some conferences, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, okay, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I have the, the same comment. It's always uh, just a, a great educational experience. Um, you, you work on really challenging practical issues uh, with very elegant tools to help us understand uh, the physics and chemistry of, uh, of things that are uh, <clears throat> quite uh, difficult to understand, like concrete, like uh, super oh. <laughs> um, yeah. so, uh, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar if you have any feedback for us we'd be grateful if you could complete the survey which we'll distribute in our follow-up email we hope you found the session beneficial do not forget to check back for upcoming webinars on micromerdix.com slash webinars uh, we hope to welcome you again very soon thank you and have a great day oh, okay thank you bye-bye thank you Hi, Roland.